been fun. Kind of culmination. This is our last set of workouts, unless something else comes up between now and draft night. But uh, really excited having the 10th pick. There's a lot of great players that we're interested in. And, you know, try to show continued progress with this team. Building this team is all about acquiring talent. You can acquire it through the draft. You can acquire it through free agency. You can acquire it through trade. We're going to continue to do everything we can to get the best possible team. So with that, I'll just open it up for questions. Tommy, um, last few off seasons, you guys have undergone significant roster change. And at the end of the season, both you and Wes remarked how maybe team chemistry continuity affects the defense. So where's kind of the line between those things as you enter a, another off season here? Well, certainly you want to have consistency, you know, but you look at the reasons that there were, you know, I, I think it's very significant where we lost Bradley, what point of the season where we lost him. That was a devastating injury. We pivoted, we made a big trade, and certainly it's going to take some time for those guys to, to gel and, and get in on the defensive end. But I think defense starts in the summer. It starts so much of the time that you put in together. And to your point, we've changed the roster a lot. I think you have to do that uh, when, when you're not successful. Uh, we had a team that we made the playoffs two years ago. It's a heck of a run, 17 and six. We knew that probably wasn't going to be replicable, and, and we went and did some big moves to acquire more talent. I think as you continue to go through this, you certainly want to settle on the team. This is our core and, and our go forward team. We're not there yet. And defense is always going to struggle if you don't have the continuity to your point. But also, I think you got to have a little bit more of a defensive mindset. That's something that Wes is doing a great job with the team this summer to do. But you also have to give, have really you know, uh, top dog players out there. And, and I think we're continuing to add those pieces. But it comes in overtime. You know, and I don't think you just come out tomorrow, this is our roster, and hey, this is a defensive team. Uh, you put all five defensive players out there, you're not going to be very good. You have to have a good blank. I think we're continuing to do that. Uh, add more pieces. I think Porzingis gives us a little bit more rim protection. He's a little bit more presence in the paint. Gafford came a long way in a short time. We're seeing progress with him. The rest of the team, you know, it just kind of continues to go as you grow. And, and, and I think we're pretty excited about what we've seen so far from the player development standpoint with our players this summer, we've got a lot of players in D.C. now and been through D.C. since the end of the season trying to get better. And I think we have an excellent player development staff that's helping them in that regard. We've got to continue to get more athletic, more length. I think that's where the NBA is. I still think you're always going to need somebody at the rim, but you need people that can go out and stop on the perimeter. You've got to contain the dribble, stop people from gutting us and getting in the paint, spraying the ball. You know, I think that's where we've really struggled is getting guys off the three-point line. And a lot of that starts with dribble penetration. So being able to do those things in a, in a better, sustained way, that's the goal for sure. I think one of our best defensive players is Bradley Beal. You know, but we've asked Bradley to do a lot over the last few years. And it struggles at, at, uh, to be a two-way player. You need a lot more. I think you, you need a little bit more assistance on both ends. And that's something we're trying to continue to add. And I think we have, you also have to develop those players. You know, we've seen some progress from Denny. We've seen some progress from Rui. Corey, we didn't anticipate Corey to play a lot last year. All of a sudden, he became a pretty significant player for us. So waiting on young players is, you know, it's, it's tough, but you got to be patient. If you're going to continue to add that way through the draft. I think we've, we've added pieces through the draft. We've added pieces through free agency. We've added pieces through trade. That all kind of start to come together. Tommy, speaking of Brad, we spoke him on Saturday. He said he just kind of started to get back on court and do those types of things. Do you have an update on his timeline? Obviously, I know there's other stuff concerning him, but uh, in terms of his rehab. I think he's in a great place. You know, the good news, and he'll always tell you first, the good news is it was his left hand, right? But I think getting all the flexion and the strength back, um, I've never seen a better healer than Bradley Beal. His body, he knows his body better than anybody. And uh, just significant to see some of the things he's able to do just in the weight room. And that's where it all starts. And he's in a good place. I fully anticipate him being ready well ahead of training camp. But where he's, you know, there's people that are ready for training camp. And then there's people who have really, really high standards for themselves. I think Bradley would tell you, you know, he's got a very uh, big chip on his shoulder for the upcoming season. You know, the injuries tend to minimize people's value in the NBA. And that's unfortunate, but it's like, you know, I think he couldn't play the way some people look and report about him. But I, I look at a guy two years ago, led the league and scored. Uh, it was all NBA. Uh, we were in the playoffs. But I get it. You know, 
at times that, that's what happens. You go down with an injury, you can't play. But I'm not worried about the noise outside. I just look at the player, and I know that's somebody you can you can build your franchise around. I know he's going to have a tremendous season coming up. Where he's at right now, it's not where he'll be in a month. And in two months, he'll be, you know, as we get ready to go to Japan, I think he'll be in full swing in terms of his, his shot. I think he's going to continue to work. You know, he's really good right now with his ball handling skills. He's going to get those tighter. I think right now he's really working on, first, first and foremost, he's working on getting strength in the hand. But creatively, I think there's ways he, he sees the game where he could score even a little bit more efficiently. You know, I'm getting back to some of the catch and shoot threes. For years, you know, that's what he was. He was a catch and shoot player by injury because of what happened to John. Bradley had to increase his usage, being more of a ball handler. And we have no problems putting him at the point guard. We're trying to get him shots. You know, it can get difficult at the end of clock, so people are throwing three bodies at him. So we have to do a better job offensively and making sure he gets cleaner looks. And some of that is strategic. Some of that is just being patient, getting the ball to the second side, third side, whatever we can to get him better looks. We got to do. But where he is right now, I think is, um, you know, most people would be happy to be where he's at. He's not. He wants to do better. He wants his shot ready to go. He's definitely uh, heard about it. Banneker, when that first shot went up, you know, nobody gave him a moment, you know, unfortunately. But I know he's going to be right there as one of the best shooters in the league, as he always is, once he gets, uh, gets his feet underneath. With the 10th pick, you guys have drafted relatively well with, uh, in that range, nine with Rui and Denny and stuff. Is there, obviously you'd like to have a, a star come out of that position anytime or, or that draft position, but is there more urgency to try and find one, someone with higher upside? Or like, how do you view the, the win now versus upside and, and kind of like, what do you think that the 10 overall pick? Yeah, I don't know if I, I would agree with win now. I think you gotta win more. I think, you know, to, to say our season's going to come down to who we draft at 10, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't ever want to do that to the to that poor kid coming in the door. That, that'd be short-sighted. Every draft has really good talent if you're patient enough with it. And if, to find those players, you know, the immediate gratification of getting somebody who can go out and make the all-rookie team and do those things, hey, that's great, but can they sustain it? Can they be in the league a long time? Um, for us, there's not a position that we don't need depth in, but I don't think we're going to do anything but take the best player available at 10. I think that this time of week, as you head into draft week, it's a really good idea not to pay attention to any noise that's out there. You know, we can move up, we can move out, we can move down. It's all kinds of options that are there, but I, I look at it as hey, we have the 10th pick in the draft. And so we're going to analyze it, what's best for the Wizards in our future. And I, I like the young players that we've added, but it's still at the end of the games. It's still going to be your top guys that have to bring that game home. You know, the, the, the depth, we're going to continue to add. You're right, stars, how, where do stars come from? You like to say, well, usually you have to have one of the top three picks, but I know Giannis has something to tell you about that. Jokic, some of the last MVPs, international players, by the way, but they didn't come from even in the lottery. So sometimes you have to be patient. You know, I think in, in those players' cases, they would tell you that their teams were very patient with them. So, at the 10th pick, I think there's going to be a talent there that can help us for sure. Is it going to help right away? I don't know. But this time last year, I didn't think Kispert was going to help us. And he did. And last year, the rush trade kind of came together around the draft. <laughs> uh, is the, the day of the draft. Yeah, okay, the day of. So I was going to say. Free agency like, started two days later. Right, right. <laughs> so we're happy we have a week this time. <laughs> <laughs> so just in, in terms of conversations, do they already start now? Or do you anticipate, like, Conversations happening closer to the draft, like what's kind of the, I guess the end spot all the time. Like what, what's kind of that process like? Yeah, you just said it. We talk all the time, and unfortunately, you know, I think part of this business is you have to have a bit of empathy for players if they see their names get knocked around and stuff. I don't, like I will continue to say you, you then you don't really hear anything about Washington. I do that specifically because I don't think it's fair for families to have to go through. And, it causes a lot of stress. At the end of the day, you know who you can talk to in this league. You know who wants to get deals done and who wants to get their you know, get their agenda out through the media. I think we always have been pretty good at getting deals done if people are willing. And you know, like if I, my job is to do the best job for the Wizards, and that's to get the best talent. So if it's through the draft, if it's through trade, through its free agency, 
we looked at all those. I, I think we're going to continue to do that. Tommy, how strenuously have you attempted to move up in the draft? Strenuously? How, with how much enthusiasm <laughs> have you attempted to move up in the draft? I think you talk to every team in every for sure. You know, but it's at what's the cost and what is it that are looking for? Sometimes you can have all the strenuously and enthusiastically you can possibly come at, but if you don't have what they want, you gotta, okay, well, what's next, we move on. But I, I think this draft has some really good options where we're at. I think you can move back and still get something similar, but moving up is always a uh, indicator that there's a talent that you don't feel is gonna be there when you draft the 10. But what's the cost to give that up? Is it gonna cost a starter, a young player, future pick, if those are the things, we're willing to do whatever it takes, then, then you gotta go all in. But you have to have a, a dance partner that's willing to do that too. Tommy, how much do you value the point guard position as a typical pure point guard as opposed to these hybrid kids that we see now that can ball handle and shoot? Has it changed for you, that kind of narrative of how you see that position in the last couple of years? Well, most importantly is I think how the, the players view it. You know, I, I do think you've watched the game. I know you watch a ton of games. There's lead guards, there's secondary role, you know, creators, and, and even third people bringing the ball up the floor, getting you into your offense. I don't think there's a pure point guard left. There's, there's points guards, right? There's an S on the end of it now. And I think it's really kind of uh, the, the, the Bradley Beals. I think Bradley's a special player because he's able to, to carry the, the ball, you know, a little bit usage-wise at point, can be off the ball. But some of the most dangerous point guards in the league are, are more dangerous when they're off the ball, right? And that's what makes Curry so amazing. When he doesn't have the ball, what he's able to do. But I think the position itself, yeah, there's going to be a lot more hands on it as we get into the, especially late in the clock, you'll have different people trying to create and get to the rim. We need more creators. We need more floor spacers out there, I believe, to take full advantage of, of what Bradley and KP can do. You know, you look at what Kyle was able to do for us last year, and a lot of that was by necessity. We were, we were running out of talent. We had a lot of injuries and stuff, and he had to move over a chair. I think, you know, you look at Pope's history. Pope was always, most of his minutes in the league been at the two. He started the whole year at the three for us. Kyle was a little bit 50-50, the four and the three. He was our starting four. Well, you know, and last year, the combinations we weren't able to ever see with Porzingis, with Bradley, they never played together. Rui didn't really play until second half of the season when other people were leaving. So trying to get that whole picture. Who's the point guard? I don't think we have one under contract right now, certainly, but we have the confidence Bradley could do it. We have some other players that we think we can be secondary playmakers. That pure point guard, I don't go into the mentality that they have to fit a certain criteria. We just have to blend well with what we have. You know, and I think that's gonna be somebody that is a very good decision maker, who sees the floor very well, is capable getting in the paint. I think we're, we really need a lot more of that. From that position, from Wes's standpoint, I think he wants somebody that obviously has a high IQ and can also guard his position. It's another thing Wes and I have in common. Is that the same value you see right now with that position moving forward? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that's ever going to change, Chris, but I think you do need to consider the way that they, you know we like to say positionless basketball, and I think sometimes that gets tired. It gets thrown out a little bit when you can't figure out what a player does the best, right? But for us, you know, I, I think guarding your position is going to be critical. And if I told you that we're getting gashed an awful lot from the point position, that tells you we need somebody with a lot better defensive mindset that we can put out there. And we, we did a lot of trades last year at that position. And we ended up the season with Sadoransky starting for us, and he wasn't on the roster until after deadline. You know? So I understand consistency of that position is going to be important. As, as you go through this process, uh, workouts, interviews, try to glean the intangibles of the player, what are the non-negotiables for you? Like, what, what are the boxes that a player has to check off to be a one for one? Well, they got to compete. They have to have a demonstrated ability to go out and compete. They have to know the game. You know, you're willing to accept that a lot of these players are 18 years old, 19 years old, so you're not looking for the super high NBA basketball wisdom because they haven't acquired that yet. They, you gotta know how to play the right way. And I think there's, uh, we, we put these guys through quite a bit, certainly in our interview process, but your resume's why you're here, right? If you, if you have a resume that says that you know how to 
navigate out on the floor. You know, I, I just go back to the, the, I like aggressive, assertive, relentless. Those, those kind of attitudes, those are our non-negotiables we like to bring. And we have to up the level of that across our, our roster, certainly. But those are the things we're really looking for. We like to think we can develop the player's talent once they're in the system and they, they kind of understand what it is that you're asking them to do. But the, the raw material, if you can find those things in players, I think you're going to find a really good player. One thing we're bumping up against now, kids, we were out at the playground this weekend. You guys, a lot of these people were here. We're at that. Um, a lot of kids don't play, grow, grow up playing on the playground. They don't grow up playing basketball. They're doing a lot of 1v1 one 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 and 2v2 two two and you know not playing the game necessarily not the traditional way and there's nothing wrong with that but when you get them into a setting now where the NBA you got to play a lot more basketball the only way to do that is to, is to play so you'll see a lot of our player development stuff this summer we're getting early fives in this summer trying to get young guys to take all the drill work they've been doing go out there and implement it on the floor and you know they're not necessarily high level games but being able to take those actions you've been working on and apply them that's what this is all about and that's what they used to do on the playground. You know, if you couldn't play, you, you wouldn't play all day. You'd be sitting there waiting to get back on the floor. So you want to be king of the court. It was fun to get back on the playground this weekend. We were all talking about how much, you know, that, that meant to the game and the transition to the game. Doesn't mean it's going to ever come back. I'm not saying that, but it was a good reminder that uh, it takes a while for your skills to, to develop, but you develop by playing, not by drilling all day. I mean, we've got multiple teams around you and behind you with multiple firsts. Do you anticipate a lot of movement on Thursday? I do. You know, it just seems like this is a, it's that, that kind of draft where some teams may say, you know what, let's just put what we have on the table. I also think a lot of teams recognize you. They're great things to have, first round picks all, you know, not necessarily having three or four of them in, in one draft. So those those allow you to get involved in other deals, certainly. Tommy, you said a couple months on the radio that you wouldn't necessarily think of drafting a point guard to be your day one starter here. I guess now that you've seen a lot of more prospects up close and personal, is that still how you feel, or has that thought process changed much? Um, I don't think the thought process changed, but I'm just trying to be a little bit um, managing the expectations of a rookie coming in the door. I think out of fairness, you know, I can say whatever. And a player has to come in, and I don't want him feeling that pressure from day one. If we were to draft a point guard, certainly we think he's capable of playing in backup minutes next year. And if he can start, hey, I'm not going to tell him he can't. But I don't want that pressure coming in the door on that person. That changes the whole experience for him, you know, walking through the door. When John was the number one pick, he knew from day one he was a starter. I don't see a John Wall in this draft. There's a lot of good young players. There's some good point guard prospects in there. But I don't think from day one, there's, there's going to be somebody that makes you stand up. But that's that's for them to prove us wrong on. You know, that's what's fun about the draft. It's the players that come in and surprise you. I guess on a related note, how do you weigh the best player available versus fits and needs, and, and especially respective to the to where you guys are drafted 10th overall? You know, I think it's just the, the ability to forecast, project where that player could be in a couple of years, where the game's going. And I don't think you want somebody that can't shoot you want somebody that is only has one skill that that's going to be their superpower. I think you, those kinds of things that you identify and say, hey, what if we could grow that player in, in these directions? You know, obviously, you want two-way players, but you know, to have an elite rebounder that can also defend, to have a couple of those things. We see these characteristics in you and we can develop them. I think that's what's going to be the big separator. There's not one thing that we say, okay, that's who we're going to draft. At 10. Right now, we have probably five people on the board. And there's teams that think similar. You know, you kind of know who looks at the game similar to our club. There's some other franchises that value things that we value too. So you got to figure out if they're going to roughly who, who's going to end up drafting who that's ahead of you. You can almost predict certain teams and what they're going to do. And then there's wild card teams. I think of us as a wild card. People use their own guess who we're going to draft. We do that, and, I mean, it's not intentional. We just try to see who has the best skill attributes and things that we value, project them forward, and, and quite honestly, who can develop into a, what we think is going to be a solid rotation player for a long time. If they can become a star, great. Well, let's start with that. You know, 
we're not afraid to take swings, certainly, but I think the draft is, is especially this year, I think there's going to be some solid players. Uh, I think just by the fact that they're still guessing at who's number one pick, tell you it's not settled yet. Tommy, when you owe a future first, does that affect at all how you draft or how precious you are to pick this year, or do you have to kind of say that's so no. far away, so much could change? No, I, you always are cognizant of it, but we could fix that in a hurry if we needed to. How much stock do you put into the guys that you bring in for actual workouts opposed to maybe guys that you're looking at that never come into the building? Well, and there's guys that we work out that nobody ever knows about too, mm -hmm. to your point. But I, I don't put a lot of stock in the workout itself. You could be a, an excellent shooter, come in here, miss every shot, and we know you're an excellent shooter. You could be maybe not so good, come in, have a workout of your life, and not gonna change it a lot either. It's more, we, we're bringing them in for the interview. We're bringing them in for the process of breaking you down, making you accountable for decisions, film work, off the court things, things that we really want to look, and you can't get it over Zoom. You can't get it over the phone. You want to be eye to eye. And, you know, where a lot of these players are being interviewed without even knowing it. You know, we, we take them through an entire day. Let's keep that in the room. But we have a lot of people interviewing with them not knowing. From the time they leave the hotel to the time they get on the airplane to leave here, they've, they've talked to a lot of people maybe without even knowing it. We download everything. I don't expect guys to be idiots in front of me, in front of our staff. Or maybe they can betray themselves somewhere else and we'll never find out about it. Just like to see your character. I think that's one of the biggest things that we hold here. Going back to your non-negotiables, I, I don't want to leave that out. I would hope that that's a given. But we're going to be up in your area in terms of your character. I mean, how do you uh, weigh a player's three-point percentage in college or in amateur ball uh, and determine whether someone can build on that? You know, that's funny. I was just I was giving Jeremy a hard time about it. I said, I don't know which one hurts my eyes worse, the free throw percentage or the three-point percent. And he laughed, because he knows that, look, in college, a lot of times you just do what the coach asks you to do. A lot of times you're catching the ball, you're jacking up a bad three-point shot, playing the shot clocks and stuff. We look at your, you know, a lot of the mechanics, certainly. If you look, go back and check out Bradley's stats when he was in college, right, his year at Florida, especially at the beginning of the year when he had two ball dominant guards. Bradley got the ball with about three on the clock, maybe let it fly. You wouldn't have thought he'd be a great three-point shooter if you looked at those things. We look at who's on the floor with you in college and what you were asked to do. I think you can improve. You know, I know a lot of people in this room didn't think Rui could ever shoot three points, three point shots. You know, and he'd like to have a word with you as a matter of fact, but he proved he could do it if you, if you work at it. And that's what player development is. I'm just teasing. Hey, he couldn't shoot his threes when he was in college. I told him that too. But if you put things in front of talented NBA players and you challenge them and you hold them accountable and they hold themselves accountable, much higher standard than we can. Like, what kind of player do you want to be? What do you think it's going to take to be successful? They're going to work on those things. And we've seen that improvement. So like a player, you didn't mention Jeremy, but I would say because he's here today, you look at his college three-point shooting, his college free throw uh, percentage. Those were not what we would say very eye-catching in a good way. But we also seen players that put in the time and you have a good development program, you think those numbers will come up for sure. I know you uh, consulted with, with Brad with some offseason moves in the past. How about the draft given he has the experience as an AAU coach and seeing yeah. a lot of these guys? You know, Bradley's been in more gyms than we can go into. You know, he's been with some of the top players and some of his kids are now in the league. And uh, he'll continue to put guys in the league. Certainly he talked to all our guys that are around youth programs. Um, some other team, you know, Isaiah Todd has one of the top teams in Richmond right now in, in Virginia, his AAU team. So guys are out there, players no tip, players no players. So we talked to all our guys, but Bradley certainly has hands-on uh, ground level views of a lot of these guys. And you know, I put Beach Jam up against a lot of NCAA games like that. It's a high pressure, high tense situation. You see what guys are made of in those kinds of situations there. He's been in those gyms. So I, play, I bounce stuff all off, off of all of our players. I like to see what they think about guys. This is kind of Wes's first, you know, really being involved with the pre-draft stuff after last year was, you know, kind of chaotic. How has his perspective helped influence you guys? Oh, it's excellent. We want everybody's input. We're very collaborative. And we're like, yeah, I think, you know, the scouts, when they put forward a player's name, I said, okay, great. He's going to move here. And you're going to live with him. You get to coach him. Right? Hey, wait, wait, wait. You, know, you got to have a lot of empathy. That's the hardest job in the franchise. 
being the head coach. And everybody thinks that we can just get the talent that you make it work, coach. That's not how this works. You kind of have to come at it from everybody, understanding the pressures of that job, uh, the day-to-day -day that comes with putting players out on the floor that you trust and what it's going to take, how, how long it's going to get. Because I think scouting is, you know, it's one of the part of what we do. You have to take all that information, acquire those players, put them in a situation, and hopefully the team comes together. You know, and time and time again, the one factor that seems to bump up against a lot is injuries, and injuries can step back a franchise. But what I'm trying to figure out how to build a team with enough depth that you can push through injuries and continue to, to thrive. You know, I think one, one thing none of us could have forecasted a couple of years ago was a world pandemic and what that can do to your season. So moving forward, hey, we want to have a, a team that's capable between the Wizards, two ways, go-go, that you can survive some of those those games where you know we were where we filled the, the most players in the roster last year in the NBA because of a COVID, not because of injury. And that was something that's very frustrating, but it could cost you a ton of games. We, we know that. So you try and build off of that and make that better too. So Tom, you know when <clears throat> you make a pick for a player, it's the scoring, the rebounding. How much do you weigh those intangibles and maybe talking to a previous coach or a, a former teammate or just what goes into the non-basketball when you make a pick as well? All that. I mean, there's, there's so much background that goes into this. And you know, anymore, especially with a one-and-done kid, you're actually watching more of his EYBL, more of his national team stuff. Because uh, their presence in an NBA box score, in an NCAA box score is a little bit different. And they're asked to do different things in college than they are on the way up. But you, you're constantly checking their character. You're constantly checking their work ethic and their love for the game. Listen, we need some more dogs. You, you hear that a lot. Our players love to say that. And you know, what does that mean? And how are you going to do that? How much of that is a mindset that we don't have, or can we bring that out in players? You know, that's that's up for debate. But I think this summer we've seen a lot of progress in our players in terms of coming together. The game's slowing down a little bit for the younger guys, and I think we're going to continue to have pieces like that. In my opinion, I, I think that's what we need to do. A little bit more patience, but certainly pushing guys to understand accountability and what we expect from that position. Tommy, there is at least four players that are going to be in the lottery or projected to be in the lottery that from their freshman to sophomore year had quantum leaps in their game. I mean, significant. Is there kind of a correlation between that? Was it just kids dealing with COVID that bubble year and then coach put the ball in their hands? Is there something significant about the uptick in their production? I think it was opportunity. And to your point, a lot of those guys were in the Big Ten, which is really interesting, right? But, and they all, uh, a couple of them were on our, our national team the summer that, that went and played. And, and you know, they were actually role players there. And a couple of them had big bust out seasons, to your point, in the Big Ten, a couple other places. But I think if you are patient in college, uh, it, uh, the first year may not go your way. The second year, you're almost guaranteed to have it go your way because they're going to, your usage is going to be extremely high. I can't, you know, is this going to be a one-off? Is it how the future is? I don't know. I, I think we're going to see a lot more avenues for kids to get to the NBA that don't involve going to college. So you have to pay real close attention to the, what's coming. I don't know if that's going to continue to happen in college. I can't speak to that. I just, we got to go where the players are and where they're coming to the NBA from. You know, and now there's even between the Team Ignite opportunity and the G League overtime elite, you know, Australia is opening up. You're seeing more players drafted from there. And obviously, Europe and China has always been options. So they're going to come from everywhere. Is there seasons that they're doing overseas? Maybe we're not seeing them. Are those the same as the, the player that's having a great second year? You know, that's to be seen. It's, it's a great question. But I, I think hopefully it's not a one-off. Hopefully you see more players stick around, go back to college for another year if they're not ready to come to the NBA. But if you're ready, come. I don't have a any qualms whatsoever. You know, if you come at 18, 19 years old, if you're ready to play, you've been collecting enough information that says you can make it in the NBA, great. But if going back to school, sucking it up, going back for another year, and that helps your draft position, great for you too. You know, but just be accountable for it. I think these guys this year, uh, I, I salute these kids. We, we spent a lot, a lot of time doing these interviews with these players, and they've been through a lot, as everybody has the last two years, but you could tell the mental fitness was a really, really big part of most of our interviews, to be honest with you.
you said back in the interview with the team 980, I think in April, that Jerry West had told you to take, don't be afraid to take the big swing. I feel like the big swing has been a phrase that's been used around here more specifically over the past couple of years or so. How would you define a big swing and would you categorize any moves that you have made thus far as a big swing? Yeah, you know, I think you know it when you see it, if that makes sense. The bringing Russell was a pretty big swing. Right? That was a pretty big deal for us because he, he was able to play, came in, did a pretty amazing job helping us get to a playoffs and the imprint that he had helped with Bradley, his leadership and things. And certainly that led to a different swing. I wouldn't say it's a big swing as much as a necessary swing to go out and acquire more talent than just one player. We felt we had to do that. Um, and I don't mean to throw that word around when I say we're not afraid to jump into deals. It's probably a better way to describe it than big swings. Mm -hmm. Big swings, a franchise player, go out there and get that. Uh, certainly that'd be a huge swing. I don't think those happen every day in the NBA period. But I think some of the moves that we've made, certainly with Porzingis, you know, a talent like that was available. They don't come around very often. He's a very unique player in the NBA, someone that we thought would be fantastic to play with Bradley. So to go out and do that, we had to move off of a guy that we signed the season before and we invested in, and then our top free agent last summer. We would still do that because it takes talent to get talent, and we felt that we made it out of really, you know, I think a very unique talent in the NBA, a former All-Star, and hopefully be an All-Star again. To me, that's a big swing, I guess, I can't quantify it with the media. I just know internally, when you talk in NBA circles, that was a pretty big deal. I don't think people would recognize that as being, that was, you, know, you had to do something big. That was a big thing. I don't think anybody saw that coming. But the big swing to me means you're, you're taking a lot of your players off your roster to you know, send to another place to bring in a, a different kind of talent. And I, I hate to do the big swings a lot of times means you have to gas your whole roster. And when you have to aggregate a lot of players, you know, you hurt your depth. And certainly you always want the best talent. So yeah, I'm looking for a good balance there. If there's something that's available, we're not uh, opposed to trying to, to get better whatever way it takes. You don't want to give up your entire roster to get one piece. But if that piece is good enough, then you know it's the right time to do it. I don't think you actively seek out every time to, to take big swings. because. Sooner or later, your, your team has to be consistent and reliable and continuity has to build. Has there been a mentality change from you from when you took over and you were just entering the game to now you come into a new position as well, a new title, and now you're a little more established? Has there been a mentality change as to approaching decisions and with your roster, or have you tried to stay consistent in your approach since you took over and nothing really has changed? Well, I think you, you learn as you go through this, certainly to uh, – <coughs> Don't be afraid to look at all kinds of different players on your roster. We, we've moved a lot of players in and out. And certainly that you learn as you go. But you, you can't find out something if you don't try it. And I don't think we've risked uh, heavily on, on huge draft capital. I don't think we've done anything to, to jeopardize the future of the franchise. But sometimes you look at a player and you say, that player with this player, I know this team would love to have this guy. So you have to have a lot of moves strategically to, to acquire talent that you know certainly if, it, if it's good for your team great but also it helps acquire a player that you have your eye on down the road you know trades don't happen overnight often seldom but they start at trade deadline you get some ideas from teams of what they're looking for even get through free agency maybe it's a carry over to the next trade deadline but what i learned is you have to have talent to get talent and more so as the stakes get higher and, and the, where we want to go before we want to make the playoffs. Well, now I think the playoffs, not that it's a given, we certainly don't take it for granted, but you want to be in that mix, you want to get home court, then you want to keep building off of that. To get there, you have to have talent. And if we're going to continue any, any which way we can to do that, I think developing homegrown talent is huge. But I also look at the league and, you know, what the Golden State was able to do this year, a lot of that was homegrown talent. They were banged up for a couple of years too. so. They brought in new players. Boston has some examples of guys that were homegrown. You know, so the game for us, we, we got to just be with the Wizards are. And we have some young players that we developed here. We have some players that we've acquired through trade. We got free agency coming up. So we're going to continue to your point. Have I changed? I think as you get 
more experienced dealing with teams and GMs who you can make deals with, who's actively seeking to, to make their teams better. I think those are the best kind of deals. I don't think you go out uh, every single day saying, hey, we're going to look for the big swing today. But you have to know where those big swings could possibly be, make that decision collectively. That's what's best for our fans. I think we made a big, big swing last summer. I don't know what sunset. Couldn't be happy. I think he's going to be one of the top bright young coaches in our game. The best thing about his first year is when it's over. You know, you start out, you're 10 and 3. Things are going pretty great. But even then, at the time, we all told each other this, this is not necessarily going to be sustainable. We won some games and we probably shouldn't. We went through some tough stuff. Couldn't have predicted COVID. Couldn't have predicted Bradley's injury. I think when Bradley went down, we were probably two games under 500. We were still on track to make the playoffs. I think if you took the best player off of any team in the NBA, particularly the playoff teams, they probably wouldn't have made. They wouldn't wouldn't have made the had the same impact in the playoffs if they made the playoffs at all. So we, we recognize that our team's better with Bradley on there. But um, I think where this season for us, we're we're the benefit of having a lot of young guys now that have played together enough, adding some more talent, someone like KP who can handle the scoring load with Bradley. I'm anxious to get to that point. I'm anxious to see the season start. You mentioned how more players are coming to the G League. How, how do you evaluate them compared to the competition, you know, maybe in, compared to college? And, and how has that changed the scouting process? That's a great question because there's, you know, the, the last, this is the second iteration of Team Ignite. The first one played in a bubble, right? They scrimmaged in gyms around Northern California against pickup teams for a long time, then they got to go to the bubble. Still in that, we saw something in Isaiah Todd that we felt, hey, that's worth a roll on the guys. The second iteration of those teams, I think there's there's been more games certainly played, and, and with the go-go, we get a chance to evaluate every team that comes through here. Um, but I, I see more and more players willing to come to the NBA via the G League because they see the minutes that they're able to play. Versus before the G League was an option, you draft a kid and he's just sitting behind the bench in street clothes. Now they have that opportunity to get better. I think you see a lot quicker development because of that. I'm really excited. Our, our uh, setup with the Capital City Go-Go is very, very unique. One of the best in the G League and now we're all in the same building. We're all at the practices. West comes to their practices. They're working out with us. There's a lot more proximity, certainly, but a lot more familiarity. And I think, you know, you, you want to always keep that hunger. You know, G League players are not NBA players. They're not there yet. But you, they're seeing every day what could be available to them. I think that gives them a little bit more hunger every day and a little bit more edge to work for. And we're seeing the progress. You know, we saw some really good young G League players for the go-go last year. They'll be on our summer league roster and have chances to get two ways, chances to make the roster, you know, that, that's all available. Did you guys draft another winger then, like a, kind of that tweener three four spot? Are you comfortable with the log jabs and that was great? Would you look to kind of move other guys out? Like how, how do you? Yeah. You, you know, the draft isn't here today, certainly, but you, you take the best talent available. And to me, you know, wings. You can say log jab, but what's the most coveted position in the NBA right now? So why not keep looking and see if there's something that you can improve upon? And certainly, these are players. They're not just by, I don't try to say this is the only thing that they can do. They're a little bit more versatility out there. I think we can play small. Now we're getting bigger and more length. We can play a little bit different, unique wise as well. But uh, you know, the log jams are log jams. They take care of themselves. You know, the best thing about talent is talent's going to play. And how do you kind of view your big situation with Thomas Spiner? Thomas Bryant, he's like a back or kind of around there. But he's a free agent. Yeah. You know, we look at all those people on, uh, J on June 30th. Certainly, we look at what's the best thing for the Wizards, what's the best thing. You know, Thomas is somebody we're very endeared to. He, he's uh, a fantastic kid, went through an awful lot. You know, didn't get a chance to play basically because of injury, and he came back and tried to get stuff a whole season into less than 30 games. I think he's very capable. We've seen what he can do in the past. Love to see that again, but free agency is free agency. There's no predicting where that's all going to go. Uh, yeah, and then just how do you kind of view that position as a whole? Because you know, first about uh, first thing is to play the five. You have Dak and Phil. Just uh, how do you feel about playing your guys at that position? I think that's and 
that's ideal to have those two. You know, I would, would take that and build on that. I think you're going to always need a third center, but more more so somebody that's versatile enough to play a couple positions. But we have guys who can play up. I think Coos can play the five a little bit. I think Rui's been able to play the four and the three. Coos can play four or five. He can guard threes. You know, it's really – in the NBA, it's all about who you can guard. If you have some guys out there that can guard length and go forward. You know, the big the – big, Big guy up the road in Philly, you know, nobody guards him, so we're not trying to say you got to go guard MB one on one, you know. But there's guys that I think we certainly take that position, and is something we feel good about having KP and Daniel. Certainly, we think they can play together a little bit. So, how much harder is it to facilitate a trade after the draft is done? I just make a trade when you make a trade. There's no easy or hard that comes with it. It's just maintaining, you know, I think a lot of times, to your point, um, after the draft, people really have a good idea of what they truly have, right? It's before the draft, you don't know if you're gonna get this certain player or whatever comes up. So after the draft, really it's, it's after that third or fourth day of free agency that a lot of deals can come together because you didn't maybe get what you wanted in free agency. You didn't get what you wanted in the draft, so now things shift and you look at players a little bit different. But I think you, you make a deal when it's best for your team. If it's before the draft, draft night, after free agency starts, you know, those, those, those kind of come together. There's no predictability on when the best day is, I promise. One more question. Last question. I think before the draft, I heard you do an interview. You said you had like 15 to 10 guys at that, that 10 spot. And so now it sounds like you guys are down to five. How would those five be able to just separate themselves? Well, we think they'll be there. Okay. For one thing, for sure. But I think they, they kind of come out with the characteristics. An original list when I was looking at it, a couple guys went back to college. You know, they, mm -hmm. they didn't put their name in the draft. So that's that's something you deal with too. Um, but I don't think there's one been one thing that definitely you say, wow, they, we didn't know that about this player. These are kind of who we thought they were. And you can put them in order in terms of for us, like who do we really think can maybe be a rotation player sooner than later. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll, that's the exciting part about the draft. You, you just kind of wait and see who's there when your when your numbers call, and we'll take it from there. But I think we pretty excited about those players that I spoke of. Well, I didn't tell you guys who they were. With our staff, we, we're, we're meeting right now and going over names of, hey, this is good. This is a good group to pick from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.